Now I'm reading this morning from Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 8. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for the beauty of it. Thank you for the sunshine, which we have been anxious for and praise you for. We ask that, uh, Father, you will help us to be grateful in any and all circumstances that you bring our way. We pray this morning that you will open your word to us. We, Lord, we trust that your Holy Spirit will be here and will be ministering and calling upon our hearts, challenging, comforting as the need exists in our life, and we pray that we will be responsive. Lord, only your Holy Spirit can open and change and work in our hearts, but we trust him for that. We pray for those who are ministering on our behalf around the world. We pray for uh, Bob and uh, Jan, who we hope we'll be seeing in the next few weeks. Um, ministering to get your word out through technology in uh, Indiana, but in parts around the world through the radio um, equipment that they help build and plan for. Pray for the Losis and the various things that are going on in their life as they translate, that you will bless them, that you will continue to help little Daniel uh, as he has this health problem, this heart problem that lets him basically live on edge all the time. And you have sustained him, and we thank you for that. We pray for many in our own congregation this morning who are sick or ill. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you will touch their bodies and bring healing to them, loved ones of, of those, as we've just heard this morning of several. Lord, we ask that you will uh, be in the midst of all of these things, working out your purposes and bringing health and restoring order, Father, to a world that is basically chaotic. Thank you that above it all, you are totally in charge. Help us to see that today. Help us to, Lord, catch a glimpse of you, maybe perhaps as we've never had before, so that our trust becomes stronger, so that our faith is increased, so that our touch of reality is right. Help us, Father, for only you can, and we all need it. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And I should mention one more thing before uh, the sermon, which is next week, Patty and I will be at, in, uh, at a wedding in California uh, this week. We, we maybe we're hoping to be back for the service next week, but because I will be gone, uh, Jesse will be uh, bringing the word to you. So uh, please come in droves next week, okay? Support him and uh, make him feel affirmed in uh, his ministry. And uh, so we look forward to that next week. Now, this passage in uh, Luke 12, last uh, one in the removing mass, which I'm glad because I, I, don't, I, don't li- I don't think I like the picture we picked, and I picked it, but uh, we'll get something better the next time, hopefully. But the, but the point is, the masks that we wear need to come off. Bob Hope was, uh, some of you, a few of you, I don't know, a few of you may remember, back when he used to host the Academy Awards a um, few of us go back that far. Nobody's done it better. I think I can say that safely. But uh, 1953, his opening was like this. He said, this is the first time that the Academy Awards are going to be televised. He said, that means that you're going to see the faces of the winners. And you'll see the faces of the losers congratulating the winners. In other words, tonight you're going to see a lot of real Academy Award acting. <laughs> that would be true, wouldn't it? We all put on a lot of masks. Here's the most dangerous thing about hypocrisy. The most dangerous thing about hypocrisy, the most dangerous thing about the way we, we wear masks, the person we most fool is ourselves. 
That's why the Bible is constantly urging, evaluate yourself. <laughs> know who you are before God. Because while you may think you're fooling others and may in some cases even be fooling others, the person you are most fooling is yourself. Now God, through uh, or, or Jesus here today, is going to really hit home hard on some issues related to this, and so we want to pay close attention to what he has to say. We said this whole passage, verses 1 through 12 in Luke 12, has to do with the subject of hypocrisy. Jesus is just leaving a lunch with the Pharisee. And as he's leaving that lunch where he's spoken to the Pharisees about the hypocrisy in their lives, he turns to his disciples, even though there are thousands of people waiting for him, and gives them the, what, the words that we've been hearing. He gives in verses 1 through 3 in this passage a warning against hypocrisy. And then in verses 4 through 12, he gives ways to avoid hypocrisy. And the ways to avoid involve all three members of the Trinity. We are to, first of all, fear the Father. Fear the Father. This is a theme that's throughout Scripture. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so he says it very strongly in verse 4. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body. And after that, have nothing else they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he is killed has the authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Fear the Father. This is the beginning of wisdom. This is the, this is the only way to stay in touch with reality is to know who God is and to respect and honor, but to also bring a healthy dose of fear to your knowledge of God. As you do that, and as you accept the gift of eternal life that he offers that would assuage the holy wrath that he has against the sin in your life, then the fear turns into reverence and awe and respect for the one who has provided salvation for you. So fear the Father. Now today we want to look at the second two parts of this, which is number two, confess Christ, and then number three, savor the Spirit or esteem the Spirit. Confess Christ, beginning in verse 8. He says, I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels, but the one who denies me before men will be denied. Will be denied. Chilling words, are they not? This is not exactly the meek and mild Jesus that we've been taught to think about from Scripture, is it? In fact, I've been searching in vain to find him in the book of Luke. I hope you have too. He doesn't exist. Jesus speaks with honesty. He speaks straightforwardly. He gives the truth. And when he gives the truth, we need to pay attention. And here he's pulling no punches when he lets us know that one day he will rule and reign in this whole world. And what he says his words here remind us that when that happens, there will be those whom he will embrace as his. And then there will be those who have denied him and he will also deny them. He is the key. He is the key. If we are to be acknowledged by him, we must acknowledge him. Now, what does the word acknowledge mean? Well, it, it's translated elsewhere. The same Greek word is translated elsewhere by the word confess. For example, in Romans 10, 9, one of the verses that we've memorized, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess him, if you, if you embrace him, if you acknowledge his lordship, not just in general, but in your life, then you can claim eternal life if you confess him. Same word. It describes, here's what the word literally means. It describes a publicly acknowledged commitment. A publicly acknowledged commitment. The Bible knows nothing of secret agent believers. It's a publicly acknowledged commitment. It means to declare publicly for Jesus. It means to 
acknowledge him as Lord and Savior in your life. This is the outward expression of a heart that's been changed on the inside by the Lord Jesus Christ. And it tells us two things about saving faith. Two things, these are both critical. One is that it confesses Christ. The second is that it confesses him conspicuously. Now it's not the conspicuous confession of Christ that saves us, but it's the conspicuous confession of Christ that tells that our faith is real. Both are necessary. Confess Christ. First of all then, there is no salvation apart from Christ. The Bible makes this clear from beginning to end, and it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if you just stop and think about this for a moment, who else died for your sins? Who else went to the cross to pay the price for the things that you do wrong every day and that I do wrong every day? The ways that we violate the character of God, only Jesus has done that. But so many people today want to have, you know, God on the one hand, but they want to deny Christ. I believe in God, but no, I can't buy that stuff about Christ. The Bible says you can't separate the two. The only way to the Father is through the Son. Jesus says, but the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Crystal clear. Matthew eleven thirty three 33 says, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Beloved, you can't deny Christ and get to God. It's not possible. In the first place, they are two persons who are part of the same essence or being as one God manifested in three persons. So in one sense, they're one and the same. But in a greater sense, the Father has said, this is the way of salvation. Sin has to be paid for because it violates who I am. Cannot just let it go. I'd have to stop being God if that were going to be the case. Not going to happen, so it has to be paid for. I've sent my son to pay for it. He's the only way. And it's just like trying to go into Windsor Castle, but at the same time denying the authority of the Queen of England, right? You're not going to get in. You're denying the very person, the only means of access. And that's what Jesus is trying to say here. He is the only means of access to the Father. He's the only way to heaven. He's the only way for eternal life. When his disciples wanted to know, how do we get to the Father? How do we get where you're going? What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. The entry point to heaven, beloved, is exactly one person wide. That's it. You must come through the Son. Thankfully, there is a way to come. If it wasn't for him, there would be no way to come. Jesus is the only one who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So naturally, he's the only way. John makes this very clear to us again in 1 John 2, verse 23, when he says, no one, listen to this, no one who denies the Son has the Father. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses, here's our word again, acknowledges, publicly acknowledges, whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. I came across um, an interesting book not long ago. I think it was a couple years ago it came out. It was a book by Clint Hill. Some of you may remember Clint Hill. He was the secret service agent who ran after President Kennedy's car on the day he was assassinated and got Jackie back into that car as she was trying to climb out. Clint Hill, he was her senior agent on her detail for a number of years while they were in the White House. And at long last, he wrote his memoirs about his time in the Secret Service, and particularly those years when he was the senior agent for Jackie Kennedy. 
And one of the things he described there was some of the inconveniences that come when you're in the White House, one of which is you can't get your mail very fast because it all has to go through a check to make sure there's nothing dangerous in the mail. Jackie got tired of that. She said, I, friends and uh, relatives write me, and I don't get the letter for two weeks, and meantime, whatever it is, is already done and over with. Need a faster way to do this. So Clint Hill came up with a way. He says, I'll tell you what, tell your family and friends, just put my name, Clint Hill, under your name on the address, and that way the people who are sorting this and taking care of it will know it's okay to send it through. Clint Hill became the name that was the access point that allowed this to go through, and beloved, in a similar way. Jesus Christ is the only name under heaven named among men by which we may be saved. The only way. Just one. So we must confess him. You must confess him. You must acknowledge who he is. Secondly, we must confess him conspicuously. Conspicuously. Believers are those who are willing to embrace Jesus openly. To deny him, to be unwilling to claim him among our friends, relatives, neighbors, whoever it is, I realize is a, it's kind of a persistent thing about us. I don't know what it is about the name of Jesus, but that name has a divisive tendency, doesn't it? We, and, it and it's easy not to want to be associated with that. I'll just be a secret kind of a Christian here. But that shows that there's an idol somewhere between us and God. It may be that we don't want to be thought stupid. That our intellectually elite uh, people would tell us how dumb it is to believe in Christianity. We don't want to be thought religious, religious fanatics. And let's face it, there are fringe people on the, on the fringes of Christianity that we would like to do anything we could to disassociate ourselves from, right? It's true. But beloved, if that keeps us from naming the name of Christ, then you see our reputation is something that's coming between us and Jesus. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's the fear of retaliation. You're at your work and you're afraid if you name Christ, you're going to lose the promotion or you will not be appropriately respected. You might even lose your job in some instances if you are, if you are outward about your faith. And so, and so our ambition is the idol that's keeping us from Jesus. Perhaps it's a relationship. There's a relationship we don't want to give up and we're afraid if we name Christ, perhaps the relationship would even have to change. And we, don't, we don't want that to happen. We have to clean up our act in some way. We don't, we don't want to lose what, what the benefit is and so that, that idol lurks out there keeping us from Christ. I, be, I understand all of us can fail at times. I've failed myself enough times to be ashamed of my shame of Jesus in certain circumstances. I know what that's like, but beloved, if this is a life pattern, if that's who you are deep down, then you have not confessed conspicuously as Jesus is saying here, and Jesus' warning is dire, but the one who denies me before men will be denied. It's a promise. Before the angels of God in the book of Luke, before the Father himself in the book of Matthew. So where are you on that? Genuine believers embrace Jesus in this life. I didn't look up the passage, but there's one in Revelation 20 that speaks of the fact that cowards will not inherit heaven. That ought to be convicting. He says in Revelation 3, 5, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Who is it? The one who conquers? the one who's outgoing in his faith, the one who is conspicuous. We may think we're fine because we know the facts and we affirm them in a church we're really comfortable. Everybody else speaks the same language. Everybody else has the same expression of faith, but if we are ashamed of Jesus the rest of the time, we need to double check and triple check. It's very possible that the one we are most fooling is ourselves. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. 
That's a test of faith. It's an open, public declaration of Christ. And I'll tell you where it starts. It starts with baptism. It starts with baptism. Every believer that you find in the New Testament is baptized is baptized after they come to faith in Christ. And what is that? It's an association with Jesus. It's an identification with Jesus. It's saying just as Jesus identified with me and my sin by his baptism. Remember how John's baptism was the baptism into, of repentance? So why was Jesus being baptized by John? Jesus said it so that we can fulfill all righteousness. What he was saying is, I am identifying with you, sinful humanity, in your sin. And what he did symbolically in that act of baptism, he did on the cross in reality when he took our sin upon him, right? And now he's just asking for us to symbolically identify with him after we've come to faith in Christ. That's the starting point. For then living a life that expresses openly our faith in Christ, to deny Christ is one more step away from reality, just like denying the Father. Imagine, imagine this. Imagine getting married, and you have what you think is a really good relationship going on, right? Everything's good. And then you go to a, to a class reunion of your spouse, and when you're at that class reunion, you're, they're off meeting people. You're off trying to just get through the evening, right? And, and you walk by and you happen to overhear your spouse talking to an old flame from when he or she was in high school and they're denying you're, that they even know you. How would you feel? You'd be devastated, wouldn't you not? Devastated. Well, that's what it's like when we will not make our public confession of Jesus. Our public confession or denial of Jesus reveals who we really are in relation to him. There's an old Methodist circuit writer. I don't know where I read about this, but somewhere. Daniel Curry was his name. He talked about how he made a campfire one night out in the plains of Nebraska, fell asleep, and then he went, he, he dreamed. Dreamed he'd gone to heaven, and angel there asked him, well, what are, you, what are you doing here? And he says, I've come to claim my place in heaven that Jesus promised me. And the angel wouldn't let him in, and so he begged. He said, I, I need to see God. Please, let me see God. So the angel took him to the throne, and in his dream, he said, I saw, it was, he said, I was dumbstruck by the blaze of the throne of God. It's like a thousand suns. He fell prostrate in his dream before God, couldn't say anything. And then a voice came from the throne and said, who are you, and what are you doing here? He's trying to speak, but he couldn't speak. And he said, suddenly a scarred hand reached out, grabbed him by the hand, pulled him up. And then a voice said, Father, this is Daniel Curry. This is Daniel Curry. He confessed me before men, and I now confess him before you. Whatever sins he has committed, whatever stains on his record, charge them all to me. Charge them all to me. I paid for them on the cross. He confessed me, I confess him. Is it the confession that saves no, beloved, but it's the confession that shows that our faith is real. That's how you test. Is your faith real? Do you confess Jesus? So we need to confess Christ to get out of the hypocrisy that's in our life. The third thing, third member of the Trinity, the Spirit Two parts to how we savor the Spirit. The first is a negative and the second is a positive. The first is don't denounce the Spirit's work. Don't denounce the Spirit's work. This brings us to a, you know, one of the most debated passages in the Bible. I'm not going to tell you that I have all knowledge. I'm going to give you what I believe to be the right interpretation of this passage. But it's not an easy one other than it's pretty clear. You don't want to be on the wrong side of not recognizing and attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 10. Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. In other words, against Jesus. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Boy, if what Jesus said earlier was tough, this is really tough, right? So is there an unpardonable sin? Yes, there is. What is the unpardonable sin? To blaspheme the Holy Spirit. 
that much we can dig out of the verse, right? That's clear. There's something that will not be forgiven, and the thing that will not be forgiven is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And the question then becomes, well, what is it to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? And all kinds of answers have been given to this. Murder. Adultery. Suicide. All kinds of answers. Are those answers right? No, they're not. As serious as they are, and they are serious. Those are not the unforgivable sin. It's none of those. David, even as a believer, exercised the horrendous sin of adultery and then followed it up with the even worse sin of murder to cover it up. And you remember God forgave him. It was forgivable. So what is the impardonable sin? How does one blaspheme the Holy Spirit? So first of all, let me give you kind of a definition and then, then let me try to show you from Scripture why I believe this is true. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to firmly, finally, fully reject the Holy Spirit's clear, unimpeachable, provable, evidence of the person and the work of Jesus Christ and further to attribute it to Satan. It is to reach a point of hardness in your heart where you mock the whole thing. You can see it, I think, in the Bible, one place in the person of Pharaoh in Egypt in Exodus 3 through probably 13 or so. Remember, how Moses went in and dealt with Pharaoh in Egypt. And at first we hear that about Pharaoh hardening his own heart. And then we hear about Pharaoh's heart being hardened. And then we start reading about God hardening Pharaoh's heart. What had happened? He'd reached a point of no return, even though he was still living. Blaspheming the work of the Holy Spirit. So clear. One of the reasons those plagues were what they were in the book of Exodus is because they were all against gods of Egypt. And God was showing himself to be superior to any other thought about who a god might be. And against all of that evidence, Pharaoh continued to blaspheme. Now, in the book of both Matthew and Mark, both of them both of them place this comment by Jesus in a context, in a context of blasphemous accusation. So I want you to turn back to the book of Matthew, and let's look at it in the, in the context that is there. Matthew 12. In Matthew 12. So I think this gives us a little extra insight into this. In Matthew 12, Jesus has healed. We've seen it already in the book of Luke, but... In Matthew 12, Jesus has healed a, a man who is demon-possessed. He's demonized. And the, and the effect in his life is that he is both blind and mute. He can't see and he can't speak. And Jesus heals him. And you can imagine the reaction. The crowd is absolutely amazed that this person who one moment ago couldn't see, couldn't see and couldn't speak can now do both. Amazing. And the people were rightfully amazed. But look at verse 24 of Matthew 12. Verse 24, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. You see, shortly after, Jesus talks about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. See, what we have here is the Pharisees, these particular Pharisees, have reached a watershed point in their opposition to Jesus. They, up to this point, they've opposed him, thinking, well, he's, a, he's kind of a, he's a minor nuisance, but they're going to be able to silence him. That's, that's their belief. But they've come to the point of realizing that's not going to be as easily said as, uh, done as said. And everything they've tried has not succeeded. His, 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 his popularity has just become more. Everything has gone the exact opposite of the way that they wanted it to go. It should have, it should have 
And I want to repeat this because the Pharisees, there's, there's, just, there's no excuse for them. It should have long ago dawned on them that truth was on his side. For a few of them, it did. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a leading Pharisee. Jesus calls him the teacher in Israel. The Billy Graham of his time came to faith in Christ. Joseph of Arimathea came to faith in Christ. But they were the rare exception. For most of the Pharisees, their opposition simply hardened against him. And they didn't know what to do with him. You know, they, they, they couldn't question his compassion. It was so obvious everywhere he went that he loved the people, would do whatever he could to help them. They couldn't deny the authority of his speaking. The people said it. You know, he speaks as one who has authority, not as our teachers and our scribes. They couldn't deny the authority of his speech. They couldn't trap him verbally, though they tried time after time after time. When we get to the last week of his life, we'll see them doing this like, like they're demon-possessed themselves. Here's the, here's the one that really strikes me the most. They never even attempted to deny his miracles. You ever notice that? They never even attempted to deny his miracles. You can search the Bible, the New Testament, the Gospels through and through. You will never find a time when somebody tries to deny the miracles of Jesus Christ. Why? It's easy to do from 2,000 years, but it wasn't, you couldn't do it when you were on the spot. It was too obvious. It was too clear. The power of God was being manifested daily. John says, if I wrote all the things that Jesus did in John 20, verse, I don't know, 30 probably, he says, if I wrote them all down, the books would fill the world. We just have a very representative, small representative sample of what was going on all over the place in Israel for three years. And nobody ever tried to defeat Jesus by denying he was doing the miracles. You couldn't. He was doing them. They were real. So they did the only thing left for them to do. They said, well, by Satan. He's doing it by the power of Satan. Sure, he's doing miracles, but he's doing it by the power of Satan. He's empowered. Can't you see he's empowered by Satan? Don't you see that? And in claiming that, they were committing an act of spiritual suicide. With more direct revelation of God than any other people in history. Nobody else has ever seen what these people saw. You and I haven't seen that kind of power demonstrated by the Spirit of God. We haven't actually been able to sit under the preaching of the Son of God. Imagine that. Like they did. And then they denied it. More light than anyone in history, they chose to claim that it all came from Satan. The rejection had reached the point of attributing every work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus to Satan. And it was a lifetime choice when they did that. They had crossed the Rubicon. There was no going back. They were now, even though in this life still, they were confirmed in their sin. What that means is there was no possibility for repentance for them anymore. Why? Because the Spirit of God had stopped working with them and there's never any repentance apart from the work of the Spirit of God. Matthew 12, 31, Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. A lot of people worry, well, have I committed the unpardonable sin then? Maybe I've done that. Let me give you some assurance. I can't tell you that you're saved or not, but I can tell you if you're worried about it, you haven't done it. People who have committed this unpardonable sin, this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, never again worry their minds about it. Doesn't happen. They've gone too far into rejection, too far into sin. See, it's not a question of the severity of sin that makes it unpardonable. The severity of sin is not the issue. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 31, therefore I tell you every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. 
The worst sin that could ever have been imagined was what? To nail Jesus to the cross. There's no worse sin than that. And yet Jesus prayed from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And we know that one of the soldiers that was at the base of the cross that was involved in that recognized that he was playing with God and wrestling with God and by all appearances came to faith. There's no sin that's so bad that it's unpardonable, but the consistent, constant attributing to the devil the works of God soon leads you to a position of being in a, in a place where the Spirit no longer works with you. It's not a question of the severity of sin. It's not a question of the, of the number of sins. James 5.20 assures us that God will cover a multitude of sins. Remember how Jesus said when Peter came and said, how many times do I have to forgive him? Jesus said, what, 70 times 7. What was that, a magic number? No, he was just saying forever. You have to forgive whatever it is. There's no, this is infinite. There's no end to this. And if he's telling us that we need to forgive that way, you can't imagine that he's not forgiving that way. Can you imagine that? It's not a question of the number. It's a question of the kind of sin, no? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all our sin, even the ones we haven't recognized, even the ones we haven't been able to call out. The issue is, the issue is the persistent suppression of God's revelation to the point of no return. Like Ju Judas, when he sinned against more light than any person in history, because even more than the Pharisees, he had seen every act of Jesus, and he reached the point of no return when he traded it in for money. Are there modern day examples? I'm sure there are. I suspect that the best example modern day would be people who have sat under the, the preaching and the teaching, clear teaching of the word of God for year after year after year and then thrown it all away at some point later on. Jesse read about it from Hebrews 10. I hope you were listening. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 26. Read the passage. These are people who looked Christian. These are people who sat there and, and took it all in, but eventually they denied it. He's a former minister. Let me just give you one quick example. His name is John W. Loftus. He's been called the crown prince of atheists these days. Mostly he's been crowned by himself. Why is he called that? Well, because he had three degrees in theology, including one where he studied under one of the greatest apologists of our time, William Lane Craig. He had pastored for 14 years when he suddenly left the ministry. Not only left the ministry, but he declared himself an atheist. He founded a blog that's called Debunking Christianity. He published a book called Why I Became an Atheist. He hated the church, and he speaks of, of how unloving the church is. He attacks the Bible on multiple fronts. A quick example of that, he says, the Bible teaches child sacrifice. His example is... God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son in Genesis 22. He doesn't bother to point out that God provided the substitute. It was not child sacrifice. It was a part of God so that our sins can be forgiven. He quotes, to make the same point, he quotes Exodus. Uh, from Exodus um, chapter 22, verse 29, where God says, the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me, which of course was not advocating child sacrifice, but was advocating service to God. And he, and he never bothers to point out, by the way, there's a tax they could pay so that their son didn't have to become a Levite, but would support the Levites who were, as a tribe, taking care of the temple duties. In other words, it was a totally flimsy Excuse, and, and he has a, a number of those going on. What is seldom mentioned is that Loftus, the reason he, he was asked to leave his ministry was because he was, he was committing adultery with multiple women at the same time, and he got found out, and he wouldn't repent, and so they excommunicated him. He later divorced, married another woman who was an atheist. It, the point is it was not for intellectual reasons that he denied Christ. It was for moral reasons. You don't have to dig very deep usually to find out that's why people deny Christ. His blog, if you looked at it today, includes multiple cartoon videos, just about everybody you want to name, making fun of them, mocking God, mocking the Bible stories, blaspheming the Holy Spirit as he committed the unpardonable sin. Only God can judge that. Only God 
should judge that, right? But the reason I mention it, beloved, because I fear for him, because if you had committed the unpardonable sin, I think that's just what it would look like. To deny the clear work of the Holy Spirit to bring us to Christ. We can only do that so long. Romans 1.18, God calls this, he says he calls people out in the days that Paul was writing this, and he says, here's what you do. You suppress the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, you love your unrighteousness more than you love my truth. And the result is, he gives three results there in Romans 1. In verse 24, in verse 24, the result is that they are given up to the lust of their hearts. In verse 26, the result is that they are given up to dishonorable passions. And in verse 28, they are given up to a debased mind depraved through and through. Turn with me to John 16 very quickly. John 16. You want to know what the work of the Holy Spirit is during this age in which we live? Jesus told his disciples, you know what? It's important for you that I go away because when I go away, the Comforter's going to come and, and he's going to be more used to you than I would be. That's incredible. It's important to you that I go so that he can come. And of course, part of the issue is Jesus can only be in one place physically, limited in his body. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit, can be anywhere. He can be and is in every believer all at the same time, wherever we happen to be. But here's his work. Look at his work in John 16, beginning in verse 8. And when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe me. The worst sin that you can do is not to believe in Jesus Christ, and it's the work of the Holy Spirit to convict. And as the Holy Spirit convicts you that Jesus really is the Son of God, that Jesus really did die for your sins, and you continue to deny that, and then what else is he doing? He's, he's, he's convicting concerning righteousness. Why? Because I go to the Father and you'll see me no longer. What's his point? His point is I'm righteous and you're not. So you need to understand what sin is, and the Holy Spirit is here to teach you that. And if you deny that by saying, no, I'm good enough, you are coming dangerously close to the unpardonable sin. And what's the third thing he does? He says, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. What he's saying is if Satan's going to be judged, guess what? Everybody who follows him will be also judged. Don't think there's no judgment. Don't think there's no day of accountability. You are blaspheming the work of the Holy Spirit when you say, I'm not a sinner, when you say, there is no judgment, when you say, God will not take charge. You are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. The unpardonable sin, beloved, is committed when we have denied God the Father by denying God the Son who reveals the Father and by denouncing God the Spirit who reveals the Son. <laughs> Once you've done that, you've done away with the whole trinity. There's nowhere left to go. Sin is unpardonable. So that's the negative. What's the positive? Do depend on the Spirit's wisdom. Do depend on the Spirit's wisdom. Back in Luke 12, beginning in verse 11, he says, and when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, don't be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. What, what a promise that is, right? What he's saying is don't be dependent on your own wisdom. Don't be worrying about the things you can't do anything about. Don't be anxious about what all went wrong. Depend on the Holy Spirit. Depend on the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will tell you what you ought. And the Greek word there is very strong, what it is necessary for you to say when that time comes. Depend on the Holy Spirit. Now, when Jesus says depend on the Holy Spirit and he will teach you at that very time, he's not suggesting laziness. He's not suggesting that if you are a teacher or a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or something else, you just, hey, just show up and say whatever comes to mind. It's not what he's saying. That would violate lots of other scripture, like 2 Timothy 2, 15, where he says, do your best 
to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. That's our responsibility. Peter similarly advises in chapter 3, verse 15, he says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that is in you. Be prepared. Whatever God asks you to do, be prepared. But his point is, when you get to the point where you're actually speaking, don't trust yourself. Don't trust your wisdom. Don't trust the wonderful illustrations you came up. Don't trust the wonderful thoughts that you think you got into your mind. Trust the Holy Spirit. I love, I've, I've said this before, but what Spurgeon used to say, he had 13 steps to go from his bottom pulpit to his top one in, those, in that old church in London. And he said every time, every Sunday as he's climbing those 13 steps, he's saying, I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Spirit. This is one of the most brilliant men who ever existed as a preacher. And what's he reminding himself? I can't do this. The Holy Spirit has to do this. But I can depend on him. Depend on the Holy Spirit. Peter and John did that, right? In Acts 4, they were arrested for healing a man at the temple gate in the name of Jesus Christ, whom, of course, the leaders thought they had put away when they killed him. And here are these guys still preaching him. And they came and they said, stop. Remember what Peter said standing before them? He said, whether it is right in the sight of God, this is in 419, of the book of Acts, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot, but cannot, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot publicly acknowledge, we cannot, but speak of what we have seen and heard. They weren't trying to get out of jail free, could have. They were bearing witness to Jesus under the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we remove the mass of hypocrisy, beloved? We, first of all, we learn to fear the Father. Appropriate, relevant, reverence, awe, respect, and fear for the God who is active in our lives and who will call us to account one day. Secondly, we confess outwardly the Son, Jesus Christ. Our Savior, our Lord, our boss, our master, our greatest friend, our Father, we confess him as all of those things. Thirdly, Savor the Spirit. We make sure we are not in some way thwarting His work. There's a great story told about Branch Rickey. He was the Hall of Fame, you know, executive for several baseball teams, Dodgers, Pirates, Cardinals. Really started the farm system in baseball, and he's probably most famous because he's the one who integrated baseball by bringing up Jackie Robinson with the Dodgers in 1947. Rickey was a devout Christian. He lived his faith. On one occasion, he was in discussions with another team for a, a trade. They're trying to trade. And they'd been at it for a couple of hours, and all of a sudden, he threw his pencil on the table, and he said, this discussion is over. And the guy said, what do, you, what do you mean this is over? We're, we're almost there. We almost have this deal done. He said, no, this is over. He said, you guys have been, you've been using the name of a friend of mine in vain, and I'm not doing business with you. I said, What? We haven't even talked about one of your friends, let alone, let alone spoken ill of anybody you know. He says, oh, yes, you have. He says, you've been using Jesus Christ as a swear word all day long. He said, that's my best friend. This deal is done. It didn't take long. The room was filled with apologies. <laughs> they got back down to business. Now, whether the apologies are real or not isn't the issue, is it? The issue is, there's a man who feared the Father more than he feared the reputation and the, what men would think of him. There's a man who stood up and confessed Jesus publicly and esteemed the work of the Spirit in his life, saying, this is what I want you to do. He did it. Don't we want to be that kind of people? It's not who we want to be. Take the masks off. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Lord, I pray for any, any who may unwittingly here this morning be treading dangerously close to something that's unpardonable because they have been rejecting and rejecting and rejecting and rejecting, saying over and over again, no, I'm going to make it, I'll make it, I'll make it on my own. Lord, would you this one last time give them an opportunity 
Would you bring your Holy Spirit to bear one more time on their heart? Would you cause that heart to open to you? Say, yes, I see it now. I see it now. I just didn't see it before. My sins are way too much to ever stand before God alone. I accept the price that Jesus paid for me on the cross. I accept him into my life as my Lord and Savior. For those of us, Lord, who are believers, any possibility of an unpardonable sin is long gone. But Lord, the possibility of continuing to wear the mass of hypocrisy continues. Would you please show us where this is true in our life. Lord, make us bold as lions to name the name of Christ. Let us be willing to be mocked. Let us be willing to be thought ill of. Let us be willing to lose a friend or two. Let us stand for Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to do it out of a heart that loves you, not out of a sense of somehow responsibility or guilt. That wouldn't prove anything. But increase our love, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.